I've completed building a my first print of an updated version of our 3D printable coronavirus model. Now the previous model is here and you can see that it's pretty much like the figures that you see on all the TVs and magazines and the like that it's a ball covered with spikes sticking straight out and this was based on data uh, that was available at the beginning of the pandemic um, but it was mainly based on structures of other coronaviruses not the SARS-CoV-2 virus during the pandemic a lot of new electron microscope imaging has been done to produce new information and that's showing that the SARS-CoV-2 virus itself doesn't quite look this way so we needed a new model here is the new model the principal feature that's immediately visible is there are a lot fewer spikes than were originally thought now maybe that was an error in the original data that was available before or maybe SARS-CoV-2 just has fewer spikes than other coronaviruses it's really hard to tell and that'll be worked out over time but this has a quarter of the number of spikes than were originally thought and uh, the other issue is that the spikes do not stick straight out from the surface that the little narrow stalk bend now one of the things I can't do in a 3d printable model is show just how squishy this thing is the real virus is quite soft and pliable uh, actually what I've painted is gray all of these colors are fake colors most everything is colorless in a coronavirus um, it, the gray part is literally a soap bubble and is quite squishy the stalks themselves are also quite bendable these areas down here at the bottom uh, I'm printing with hard plastic and so my models are rigid and hard um, but that's just not the case uh, to represent that bendiness we've made the model so that it's not spherical it's kind of oblong and we've made spikes that sometimes are more bent like this one at the bottom here and sometimes they're more straight up and down um, but unfortunately they don't move oh I have a train coming through town again and an airplane this is a busy city uh, one of the practical details this particular model I built with a flat bottom so I can use it as a paperweight without it having to sit on its spikes and be unstable um, but that's just completely artificial it is continued over and it's covered with spikes all around it now the details of the model are that there are three different kinds of proteins here there's the spikes that are quite obvious sticking out and everybody focuses on the spikes when they talk about coronavirus uh, the spikes uh, bind to the cell and trigger the import of the virus into the cell the little green dots are called the M proteins I think originally in the literature that was the matrix protein but everybody's just started calling it the membrane protein now because it sits in the membrane these are smaller proteins uh, they barely stick out of the soap bubble um, but they actually penetrate well into the center of the virus and interact inside where the genetic material is stored and so they basically are the link pins that hold this soap bubble to the genetic material and keep it uh, as an integral structure as as one solid piece it doesn't fall apart 
The yellow spots are called the E protein for envelope protein, and there's really not much known about what they actually do. Uh, there's about 20 of them on the surface. Now, there is a lot of debate in the literature about how these things are arranged. Are they randomly distributed over the surface, or is there order to it? Or are there relationships between them? Some papers have said that the spikes are associated with M proteins, and so there'll be more M proteins around a spike. And some papers do not report seeing such a thing. Uh, other papers report that there are more M proteins around areas where the curvature is greater and fewer M proteins where the curvature of the surface is less. Um, but again, that's not reported by everyone either. So it's not entirely clear what the truth is. So in building this model, we uh, just chose to randomly distribute things. Now, a lot of people make the mistake and think that something that's randomly distributed is uniformly distributed, that there's a roughly equal spacing between things, but that's not how randomness works. If you have something randomly distributed, you're going to have some places where there are clusters, like here and here, and other places where there's thin, and that is just how randomness works. If you do not see that, then you're not looking at a random distribution. The final feature of this model is that we can model the RNA. And so there is an RNA molecule that's inside of this uh, shell that contains the genetic information for this virus and allows it all the information it needs to take over the cell, uh, shut down the cell's immune response, its ability to, to fight off the virus, and replicate the virus. And that RNA is a big molecule, uh, and this isn't working great. It tends to get tangled up inside, which is why this is not how it comes out. So there's actually about 10 feet long piece of RNA that I've stuffed in here that all comes out into your cell and is interpreted as genetic instructions by the cell to start making proteins that the protein that the virus needs to replicate. Inside there, this this RNA is very delicate. It's very easily degraded by the cell and so it's generally protected by being wrapped around with a protein that the virus encodes how to make. Um, but very little is known about how that actually works, and so I don't have a model for that. I just have this model for this long, thin piece of RNA. Now you can compare this virus to a other kind of virus. So this is, on the same scale, a rhinovirus, which is a common cold virus, it also infects the lungs, of course. Um, but you see, it is quite a bit different in shape. Uh, it has no gray parts. It has no membrane. It is a solid protein ball with the RNA on the inside. The blue spots are like the spikes. They bind to the cell and cause the cell to ingest it to get that RNA into the cell. And the green parts of the rhinovirus correspond to the green parts of the coronavirus that they give the virus a shape, a structure, and they also reach inside and interact with the RNA and hold the whole thing together. So viruses tend to have these similar sorts of things. Uh, similar, there's got to be some way to get into the cell, some way to hold the virus together and protect it, and the genetic material on the inside that you're not going to see from the outside. Now, I have another model here of poliovirus, and you see to, 
this scale, this is indistinguishable from the rhinovirus. And the main difference is, is that this receptor has a slightly different shape. This one will bind to a protein that's on the surface of lungs and nasal tissue, and therefore it's a respiratory illness. Poliovirus will bind to a protein that's on the surface of intestinal cells, and yes, polio is mainly an intestinal disease. Um, only if you have a serious infection that gets into your blood will it also infect nervous tissue and cause paralysis. So, vastly different sorts of shapes, but every piece has an analog in the other ones because these are basic functions that have to be performed by a virus.